Welcome back to Talking Naturally. I'm Annie Tindley, um, one of the trustees of the Natural History Society. Um, and can I introduce, uh, could you introduce yourself today? Yes, uh, my name is John Richards um, and uh, I'm an um, ex-professor of, of, of botany here at the University of Newcastle. Um, I've lived in the North East now the second time round since 1970, uh, so 53 years, my goodness. I retired about, um, what would it be now, about 15 years ago, I suppose. Wow. Uh -huh. And well, uh, all that time I've lived in Hexham. And uh, I've been very much involved both in gardening and in natural history uh, in the North East uh, over that time. Brilliant. So, yeah, Hexham seems to be a bit of a mecca, actually. Um, but we'll come back, we'll come back to that. Um, and I'll pick up on your interest in, in gardening and maybe how that ties in with your natural history interests. But if we can go back to the beginning, um, what first sparked your interest in natural history and the natural world? Well, um, I, I've, been, I've been interested in natural history as long as I can remember. I think really as long as I could walk or talk. I right. mean, it really goes back that far. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost as if it was innate. In my genes. Yeah. Uh, my father was something of a natural historian. He was actually a, a university lecturer in microbiology. Oh, right. uh, but, but so he was a biologist, but not so much professionally a natural historian. He was very keen. His mother uh, was a very keen botanist and bird watcher. Uh, she yeah. sadly died when I was only four. She was 60 odd. Um, she came from South Wales. That side of my family is, is Welsh. Okay. Um, and um, I think she, she, it's difficult to know whether I was inculcated in it or yeah. whether it just was there anyway. But by the time I was five, I was scribbling little primitive nature diaries and drawing sketches oh. of birds and uh, things. I, what, one of my earliest really clear memories is that in 1951, when I would have been eight, we went to the Festival of Britain. Oh, yes. Now, the Festival of Britain had a most wonderful butterfly pavilion, which was put together by Elhu Newman, who was very much a media person of those days. Um, he ran a, a nature program for children, amongst other things, and he ran a butterfly farm. He was one of my early heroes. But I think butterflies were perhaps my first thing, together, I have to say, with railway engines, which we will pass on. Fair I was a very keen train spotter. <laughs> Although I do think that, you know, that um collecting in the um taxonomic sense mm. um or just identifying things yes you know it's the same skills the same sort of interest um which, which i i seems to have been innate to me all my life really yeah that's and so do you have a clear memory of that butterfly house that that exhibit well, I, I do really i mean yeah. i do remember some of the things i remember being I mean, I was already deeply in love with butterflies, and I remember this being the most extraordinary experience of my life. I mean, I remember seeing wonderful things like purple emperors and swallowtails, which, of course, I haven't seen in the wild at that stage and mm -hmm. rarely have since. Um, and um, just, you, you know, just being completely entranced, totally yeah. blown over by these things. Amazing, amazing. So what is it about butterflies that you particularly love? I don't know. I'm no idea. Yes. Something intrinsic. I mean, obviously the colours and um, yeah. their behaviour. Um, the fact that they're quite difficult to get, you know, yeah. I'm a burger and I'm into dragonflies. And these are all things that, I mean, unlike plants, which sit up and beg on the floor, yeah. <laughs> um, although you may have to walk a long time yeah. before you get there. Um, yeah. But um I just don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. It was just something. It's like falling in love yeah, with a girl, you know. I mean, you just don't know, do you? Why it's that thing? Yeah, yeah. But there it is. Okay. So, so you had. So it sounds like you had that, you know, a family interest and that love right from the start. So, did you deliberately decide to go into botany as a as a kind of career and research career because of that? Or? No, no, it wasn't anything like as simple as that. I, I, I was into, as I mentioned already, even from, from being young, um, a lot of fields of natural history. And like so many other people, I got into plants through orchids. Ah, okay. Um, and by the time I was 11 or 12, 
And I've emphasised the great freedom of those days. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was born and bred in Reading, um, um, not far from the Thames, in fact, in, in West Reading. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, we had the chalk hills to the north and we had the heath to the south and we had the River Thames, which itself is a wonderful natural history resource. And, um, um, and the great forests um, on the Hampshire border, yeah. all these things. I mean, I was cycling there with friends by the time I was eight. <laughs> you know, 12, 13, 14 miles. Yeah. I mean, it's unheard of. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely unheard of. Yeah. But it was normal to us. Yeah. And, and I mean, by the time I was 13, I knew the area of a 12 mile diameter of Reading, you know, very thoroughly indeed, yeah. inter intimately. Uh -huh. um, I, I don't know what we start on. Um, yeah. No, I, I can't remember what you're asking me about. Then. No, it was about how you got into botany specifically. Oh, botany, orchids, yeah. that's right. So I started cycling off. I mean, at, at the age of 12, I do have a black and white negative I took with an old 620 negative of not only several orchids, but also of the green hellebore, Hellebore oh. viridis. And I remember going up, this is a, you know, flowering now. I mean, it's a yeah. February garden. Yeah. And um, I remember cycling off with a friend, Tim Abbott, one. Um, one February, cold February day, 12 miles, you know, to a place which became a famous nature reserve later on, and yeah. became, became the War Boat Reserve. And I, much later, became actually briefly War Boat Successor at Oxford. Oh, wow. Uh, so, so that was a big deal. Yeah. As well. um, yeah. And uh, to see the green hellebore uh, and, and, and take its photograph. But anyway, yes, I was, I, I got into orchids really. When I was 15, we, we, we had a, a thing called, um, I, I, uh, it, it was a, a, an essay competition or a project at school. Yeah. And if you won it, you got a day, half day off. It oh. was a boarding school, so that was quite Yeah, yeah, day. yeah. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> that's, right. that's right. So I entered this thing when I was 14. I mean, there was a senior and a junior, mm. entered the junior branch. And really just with a load of photographs and, and, and a little written essay about the orchids that you could see round uh, Reading, all, yeah. all taken with my my black and white 620 photograph. And, and my, my head, who, who was actually quite a well-known botanist, John Anstead, I mean, I was lucky in that regard. Yeah. But it came later and that was actually, you know, happenstance. Mm. Um, but writing on it, the photographs are more or less recognisable. <laughs> Which I think was fair comment. Fair feedback. So, so you know, I, and and then very much, I, I again, I, I had passions, and mm. one one of my early passions, I suppose, when I was 15, 14, 15, was that wonderful new naturalist book called Mountain Flowers ah. uh, by uh, Raven and Walters, and I found the Walters, Max Walters, bit of it rather stuffy at mm -hmm. that age. Um, he was my external family much later on. You didn't tell him, did you? When you I went? didn't tell him, no. He, and he did pass me. I used to think at the time, I joined the time of my exam, I, I, I thought I knew much more about the subject than he did. Which was A, um, uh, I think, typically Brigadio, and B, probably true. <laughs> yeah, <that's> true. <laughs> well, it was a thesis, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway. But um, the, the other half, um, John Raven was the most extraordinary man. He, he was the father of Sarah Raven, who was in the media, gardening, and so on, quite a lot today. Yes. Uh, he was a classic Don, but also wrote wonderfully. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, his bits of mountain flowers, I just fell in love with completely. So nothing would do, but we used to have our holidays in, in, in the Lake District, or at least in West Cumberland, because mm. uh, my uncle ran called a hall oh, right, yeah, yes, yeah. in the very early days. In uh -huh. fact, you're one of the guys who went to switch the putty reactor off when it was <laughs> Anyway, um, and, um, you know, not, nothing would do but that I would I could climb um, the Wastel Springs and see Pemberton Fruticosa there or yeah. some of the other rarities, you know, at the age yeah. of 14 or 15, all by myself. Yeah. Um, and then at the age of 16, my father had died by then, and um, some friends, um, very kindly with their family, my brother and I and mother, um, I think we were in two cars, mm -hmm. went for a sort of touring holiday in Scotland. Uh -huh. And on one, one of the stops, we we, uh, we we went to Aberfeldy, which is at the eastern end of Loch Tay. Mm -hmm. And above Loch Tay rises Ben Laws, which is the most famous of all the Scottish mountains, mm -hmm. 
wonderful place. Ah. So at the age of 60, I knew all about Ben Laws by then. So yeah. um, uh, I had to go up Ben Laws. They had two days there. So um, the guy, uh, the man who had taken us on holiday, dropped me off there. There seemed to be no, uh, 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 at the lakeside. Yeah. Um, where there was supposed to be a path on the map. And nobody seemed to be very much worried about me or indeed how I was going to get to the hotel, which was 10 miles down the road. Yeah. Um, at the age of 16. So I I, I climbed up. <laughs> it's very and I, high. I saw some of the, yes, nearly 4,000. Yeah. Um, I, I saw most of the, well, a number of the major rarities. Okay. Uh, yeah. Including I, 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 and the wonderful drooping saxophone, which more or less only occurs there and is actually very difficult to find. That was serendipity. Yeah. Um, and then walked out again to the lake. And, Thumbed a lift back to ten miles back. Back to Abbeyfield in the right at six o'clock. And everyone said, "My job." Yeah. I mean, I would have been today. You know, because my anyway. I know. People, people seem to have so much faith in me then, which was wonderful. Yeah, I guess that's that's right. Although I, I have memories myself of walking up Ben Lawrence many times, but now of course there's a National Trust car park. Yes, a good. Nearly a thousand feet up. It, 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 saved, it saved you about a third. It does. Yeah. It, yeah. I've been up many times since. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been in two Alpine clubs ever since. Right. You know, and and um, really holidaying or leading tours. I've led fifty odd tours right. uh, all around the world in mountains. You know, um, yeah. New Zealand and um, the Rockies, and um, mm -hmm. I've been to the Chinese mountains, the Tibetan. And um, three times, and, and so on. Yeah. And uh, I mean, my hobby botanizing, as against my professional botanizing, ha has largely been in mountains around the world. Right. And I have been president of the Alpine Garden Society, so you know that's quite a big do. Yeah. The Alpine Garden Society is is a strange society from a botanical, from a horticultural point of view, because. It's the most botanical of all the right. horticultural societies. And yeah. It puts really just as much stress on going to see the plants in the wild as growing them growing in the garden. garden. And of course, it's a big deal if you can get a pinch of seed and yes. do both. And do you have a particular favourite global zone or world zone? Oh, or? yes, Western China. I oh, mean, really? oh, yes, and everybody else Ooh. would say the okay. same. Oh, it's, it's streets ahead of anywhere else. Right. Yes. I mean, the Andes are good, and I've never been. Okay. But I think I think everybody would agree Western China is and Eastern Tibet. Right. Streets are everywhere. Really. Just for the variety of yes. plants. Yes. And, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And they're all some, somehow all much more beautiful and yeah. uh, sexy there than anywhere else. You know. Wonderful. Yeah. It yeah. is a terrific area. Yeah. yeah. Marvelous. And so, so you're. So many of my good garden plants come from there as right. well. Of course, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll come back to the gardening point actually in a moment, but. Um, so uh, after sort of romping up Ben Laws and roaring around the countryside around Reading, so you decided to go to university? Yes, well, yeah. that, that's really the next interesting point. I, 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 for whatever reason, I didn't do terribly well at school. My, my A-levels were a total disaster. Mm. Um, I'd applied to Durham, which I think was a very good idea of my headmaster mm. um, at that time. Um, it was nothing like as prestigious as it is now. <laughs> And I think I had vague Oxbridge dreams, which I was nothing like good enough for. And he thought, you know, second or mm -hmm. But in fact, and, and so I suppose it turned to me. I mean, I had three wonderful years in the castle mm. and um, mm. a beautiful time. And I was very lucky that I was appointed. Um, oh, sorry, I was in there at the same time that David Bellamy was appointed. Oh, really? So, yeah, he sort of took us very small year under his wing. Uh -huh. Anyway, what I was going to say was that um, I did actually go there to do botany, mm -hmm. um, but I was already a bird ringer by then. Okay. And John Coulson, who goodness knows is still with us, he's now, I think, 99, uh, but was a lecturer there at, uh -huh. at, at Durham, a uh, very famous bird man, um, bird academic. Um, knew that I was a ringer and all the rest of it, and he he did all sorts of things like um, to, to to try to get me to read zoology. Like he took me to the farms on a trip with the postgraduates. I was the first year student. <laughs> 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 none of this sounds very modest, but it, it it is true. Yeah. And um, uh, anyway, to cut the long story short, I think. 
I think probably, in fact, Jack Crosby and David Valentine were the two people who turned my head then, mm -hmm. because I, I, I became, at that stage, the end of the first year, very, very interested in what was then known as experimental taxonomy, right. which is the interface between genetics, evolution, and taxonomy. Right. In other words, if you like, the scientific basis of classification. Okay. These days, of course, DNA completely dominates that, but okay. in those days, it wasn't heard of. So you looked at all sorts of things like chromosome numbers and C proteins and right. so on and so forth. Ultrastructure, you know, electron microscopes had had by them yeah. and so on. And scanning electron microscopes. Um, wow. So, uh, and, and that's what really turned me on, really. I mean, in, even in my second year, um, I did quite a big research project um, on, on dactylorhizus marsh orchids, right. which is a, a genus I've been interested in ever since, really. In, in fact, when, when it came to doing a PhD, um, I, I had decided to stay in Durham partly, I think, because my girlfriend to be white uh, hadn't finished yet. Yes, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, it so, uh, yeah. I mean, important things. Right? <laughs> We're recording. <laughs> You may never see it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but and, and I don't dare say a certain amount of calories, but anyway, I stayed to work with um, Valentine, and, and Valentine gave me the best present. I mean, he said, you know, that is not particularly interesting. And, mm. uh, you know, they, they, they'll get you not, not much further, and so on, and everybody does orchids anyway. Yeah. Um, um, but nobody has ever looked at Chris Stantlands. Right. And that was said to me um, when I was 21. Um, and um, really the basis of the project I did for my PhD was the fact that um, most dandelions are apomictic, have no sex. Uh -huh. um, and that means that the mother-daughter lines you give species names to, so-called microspecies, you know, um, brambles are like this and, and, and hawk greens and, and, and um, alphamillas yeah. and a few other things like that. And, and dandelions, but and uh, on the continent, they they had built this great um, structure of um, over a thousand, probably nearly two thousand by that stage, micro species of all the you know which they named all these lines. Nobody had ever really looked at the British ones at all. Right. Um, but also um, in Central Europe, somebody had just discovered that some of the populations still had some residual sexuality. And I was really asked to look for this in yeah. Yeah. Britain. And it, it was ironic because I did find it, but it turned out actually to be a rare introduction of a sexual plant from Central Europe. And it okay. wasn't one of our dad oh, yes. at all. It, it led to a letter in Nature, but it's only many years later that I became aware that it was almost a fraud from that point of view. It wasn't really the British dandelion anyway. Um, um, well, but, you know, I mean, that really has been the basis of my life ever since, you know, I yeah. mean, for the last um, nearly, well, certainly more than 55 years, um, I, I've, I've worked on dandelion and from scratch built up um, a, a taxonomy. I mean, obviously, most yeah. of the species weren't mine, but, um, you know, we, we have in Britain, most of them are mine or co-authored, yeah. uh, named some what, 40 or 50 new species. Um, or, or, well, yes, this is what you can do with it. Things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've got a dandelion named after me, and when, when asked, um, you know, anybody who's had anything to do with dandelions always has a dandelion yeah. named after me. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, and, and in fact, um, you know, during lockdown, I mean, there, there was, I had done a sort of guide with a, another chap. Um, 25 years ago, mm. um, but it was just black and white illustrations. And um, in the days when you couldn't produce masses of color illustrations cheaply, which you can now, yeah. uh, which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so in lockdown, I, I, in, in fact, it was uh, published just over a year ago. Um, wrote wrote a new handbook, which uh, is the latest thing, and which I have to say I'm very proud of, and it's won the. Uh, a couple of prizes and, and so on, you yeah. know, so it's obviously uh, very well regarded. Yeah. But that's how I got into that. What I then worked on, which was really much more respectable, I mean, the taxonomy was almost a hobby, um, uh, which has lasted most of my life. What I actually worked on for some years was the genetic basis of 
the switch between the sexuality and the epilepsy, oh, which has got great plant breeding potential in terms of crops and so on. I have to say it's been something that has defeated uh, greater than minds of the mind all over the world and still has to a large extent you know yeah. can you get apomixes into any old crop plant that you want to no you can't I mean latterly I actually um because of my interest in apomixes I went to um Malaysia for three months I'd had a, a couple of Malay students so right. I had contact there yeah and I went to UM and uh, worked on one of their wonderful fruit trees called the mango steam which is incidentally one of the most delicious things you've ever eaten okay um but it is in fact there is only one mango steam one female mango steam right. which then gives rise to other female mango steam so there's entirely you know a single yeah. genotype by seed very right. interesting uh, and of course, it's impossible to breed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there are other garcinias which, um, uh, you know, have males and, uh -huh. and will potentially, anyway, cross with it. So I was interested in that side of things and yeah. breeding new magazines. That actually has made some progress, um, although yeah. with their their fruit people, but they 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 didn't they weren't showing much interest in the magazine. And I I like to think that I encouraged okay. that. Got it. Yeah. 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 And so, um, and, and maybe carrying on from that, can we talk about how, you, or in your mind or in your work, how you link your, obviously, your sort of academic research expertise into gardening as well? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, well, I suppose that the area that that's been most obvious in is in the genus Primula, which we haven't mentioned so far. Mm. And that's been my other big genus really mm -hmm. um and which i monographed well for the first time maybe uh, 20 years ago but there was a second edition which is much better mm -hmm. came out about 12 13 years ago just after i'd retired uh -huh. yeah 2000, some time. <laughs> 2003 yeah. well it was it was actually the year that i retired the second edition mm -hmm. came out that's right and by then we had much more dna information than we did the first time around so the um uh, uh statistic side of it is, is, is much sounder mm. um and uh so i became in fact i, re I really inherited this from from one of my teachers at, at durham jack crosby because uh he was very interested in um the breeding system of primulas with a um, so-called pin throng system which um it, 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 well, it's well known to some gardeners as well, because okay. in fact, uh, the, the primrose and well, all the 400 odd species, or most of them, um, have two flower types. I mean, they either have a, a pin or a thrum flower. Uh -huh. um, and I mean, a plant is either a pin or thrum, like being either a man or a woman. Mm. Um, and um, seed will only set if you cross between the two types. Um, so, and then there, it's really quite interesting because there are genes which control the physical side of the flower and there are genes that control the mating sides of the flower just whether the pollen will germinate or not and the tube will grow and so on um and um uh, so they the two sets of genes and in fact there are probably about nine different loci involved right. are all linked to, quite closely linked on the same chromosome right. uh, so the way that that has evolved is something that i became very very interested in yeah because it as i have been saying I mean, I became more and more interested in plant breeding systems. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. in 1988, I published a textbook called Plant Breeding Systems, and that had a second edition um, in the 90s, yeah. um, which again was much better. Um, but um, so that was one of many. I mean, I got involved in Daishi as well, I got in, in, which is males and females in plants. Uh -huh. uh, so I got involved in really quite a lot of the different mating systems of flowers yeah but it was and of course that is what the dandelion system is as well you see yeah um and um but but anyway i i did quite a lot of work on the primitive system and i was lucky enough to be given money to find a number of students who worked on that John yes. Wood, they were too much yeah um and uh, that gave rise to actually probably 20 papers i have a lot of papers yeah um and I suppose is the body of experimental work I might be better known for rather than the, the dandelion yeah. stuff because most of that was earlier. Uh -huh. um, but again, along with that, you know, my, my interest in taxonomy grew of that particular genus. Mm. And it is like 
not as big as Tarascan, but I mean, uh, for a second, an ordinary, straightforward plant, you know, rather, yeah. rather than an apomictic group. Uh, it does have an awful lot of species. Uh, uh, yeah. I think near a four fifty now, probably. And I wrote I wrote a big monograph of all these that again was well received at the time. Mm. Quite a lot of it was cribbed, but um, <laughs> uh, the experiment side of it was yeah. mostly original. Yeah. Yeah. And so. And, and yeah. of course, yes, my experience with drawing them. That's right. Yes, yes. that's right. So that, so that, that's where, that's where that that's where that comes in, and. Um, uh, I oh I mean I have mostly grown I mean I still probably grow eighty different sorts of I mean species uh, but I mean I have a, in the past grown up to about twenty hundred and twenty they don't last yeah. <laughs> you keep on raising the damn things from seed yeah. and a lot I mean and this is where China comes in because the heart of the genus uh, where where it evolved and radiated and and where the real richness is is in Western China. I see. Um, and um, as a result, I mean, many of them are high alpines and uh, they can be beggars to grow. Yeah, I'm sure. Which is good fun. Yeah. And, and if you can take one along to an alpine garden society show, uh, people form and beg. And um, um, it'll be dead next week. But, you know. But it had yes. its moment in the it, it's had, it, I had my moment in its Yes. In its, um, and so are you you're growing these in around where where you live in Hexham, yeah, 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 right. yeah. yeah. Similar to Western China. <laughs> well, it was okay. uh, to a certain extent. Yeah. It's a problem we've always had um from that point of view for the monsoon plants. Mm -hmm. is that our monsoon comes in the winter uh, and the summer tends to be dry, whereas their winters tend to be very dry and the monsoon comes in the summer. Um, and the more you can, I mean, keep the plants on the dry side in the winter and, and uh, water them as much as you can. That's, the, summer, the, way to that's the way to do it. It is quite hard work. You've got, you can't go away on holiday. Yeah. <laughs> At least you can. Not at that time of year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I mean, let, let you know, even in the last 20 years, the um, the effect of climate change really? from, I mean, you know, in Hexham, we had 40 degrees on two days last year. You know, even in Hexham, and I mean, these I things know. peg out at 28, yeah. let alone 40, you know, yeah. it's not much fun. No, yeah. I mean, and, and thinking back over over your, your time, I suppose, particularly in the Northeast, um, you you seen that climate change? Are there any other major changes you've noticed in the natural world? Oh, I mean, I think the other big one is um, the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. Right. Okay. And uh, you know, which which I think is greatly overlooked. And I think, in terms of the distribution and the problems that our flora, native flora, has at the moment, uh -huh. I think it's quite as significant as uh, as climate change. Right. And I think. I mean, it's an area I've never worked in. I think there have always been, particularly based on Sheffield, uh, a, a, a group of ecologists who, who have been repeatedly saying this, and not many people take much notice of it. But the fact is that, you know, basically because of um, um, uh, car exhaust, oh. you know, and rain through car exhaust, um, the NOx gases, so yeah. called, and these then precipitate out as nitrites and nitrates. Um, and to a certain extent, ammonia as well. Uh -huh. um, so, so the, the eutrophication is not localized now. Eutrophication, you know, some heather more in the middle of nowhere yeah. is getting as much nitrogen deposition as um, your back garden. Yeah. And, and as a result, you see, you're finding all sorts of coarse herbs growing in all sorts of places where they didn't before. Right. Uh, nettles and big grasses and goodness knows what, docks. Yeah. Um, out competing all, you know, the little alpines or yeah. um, um, tiny little plants of the hills. And people are not noticing that because it's sort of an invisible process happening apart from... The... It's, a, it's, it's really about competition. Yeah. It? It's not about a plant dying. It's about a plant being snuffed out by... Big strong thing, yeah. 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 Um, and so my, my last question then is um what's what's kind of keeping you busy at the moment? You've obviously been, you know, had a big lockdown project and, and, and the publication. Are you working on anything? Um I've just submitted a paper actually. I didn't take well, I suppose it did take work in the past, but I, I pulled everything together. Um on um <laughs> uh, some we, we 
Another genus that we haven't mentioned that okay. I've been very much involved with is Epipactis, which are orchids called Hellebrines. Uh, yeah. And I'm the um, British uh, uh, referee for them and so on. And um, we became interested in them because uh, plants that started turning up on metal soils are, are, along the time, which turned oh, out to be an interesting plant. And uh, I've worked together with a group in Edinburgh that have done the DNA work and, and, and so on. But um, um, a Belgian who has a reputation for naming too many species um, came along one year in 2003, in fact, and decided the um, uh, June Hellebrine orchids on Lindisfarne mm -hmm. were a separate endemic species found nowhere else in the world. And he called them Epipassis sancta, okay. um, And uh, the, these, um, um, uh, well, anyway, for the last 20 years, British botanists have gone along with this, although I think quite a lot of people have been a bit unhappy about it mm -hmm. um, and, and thought, well, you know, okay, they're the only June Hellebrines on the East Coast, but you see, the plants in the time have been spreading eastwards and most recently have been found at Walls End Swallow Ponds of all places. Um, so we're not far from the East Coast. Anyway, yeah. um, anyway I think I approved to my own satisfaction, and certainly the referees, um, that our plants really are just in the of Right. So uh, that, that paper went to, went to press only a fortnight ago. But the quick answer to your uh, question is dandelions. I mean, okay. I mean, the dandelion season hasn't quite started yet. Um, it'll start in about a month uh, in Cornwall, right. um, because Cornwall has lots of special dandelions, well, several special dandelions, and there are several enthusiasts down there, actually. And uh, <laughs> I remember getting an email from one of them on, I think, about the 10th of April, saying, uh, our season is over now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, just started. Yeah. <laughs> a bit like, bit like daffodils. Anyway. Um, so, so in a, in about a fortnight or three weeks, I, I, I shall start getting loads of dandelion photographs. Right. Which for the next two months, well, until the end of May, probably, uh, will will take me half a day. You right. know, uh, um, just sorting through them. These days, I mean, they they used to send me piles of dried plants, um, well, but, but the wonders of digital photography. Yes. And people know what to take good close up photographs of now uh -huh. of the various different bits. So I don't get, I mean, I do get, do get sent 500 or 1,000 dried plants a year, wow. um, but but I get sent a lot more photographs than that, or at least, I mean, the photographs are probably nearer 10,000 because they take 10 of each one, you know, but wow. uh, yeah, wow. it, 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 is a, it is a lot of work. But then again, you see, you know, we've got 250 native dandelions. Um, we've got a database with 65,000 records in it. Uh, so we've got quite reasonable distribution maps on a 10k square yeah. basis, you know, yeah. um, of, of all our 200, of course many of them are very localised, but even so, it's a lot It's a lot of records and it's a lot of work and um, at the moment I, I try in my dotage, uh, <laughs> well two things really, one of which is to, to, to make sure that all the uh, authenticated records I've seen, mm. and the second of which is that you know, when I do find this stuff, this wolf and coral, where there are other people who will be sufficiently reliable to carry the thing on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the well, the ways I do this, apart from identifying all these things and encouraging the people who I think have got a talent, uh, it, it, it is to run a, a, um, a field weekend of the year, right. uh, which I've done for the last 10 years now. Brilliant. Um, for Do you get so, that locally here, or is it? No, locally? no, no, all over the country. Right. Um, right. And the last one was in Wigsonshire. Okay. Uh, at Port Patrick. Uh -huh. um, and uh, this year we're going to Peterborough. Oh, right. Well, we're we're running. Uh, we're we're doing Northamptonshire, but Peterborough is a good centre and going west from there. Yes. Um, yeah. But yes, we we've been in lots of different places really, and uh -huh. we've come to a couple of sites in Wales. And, uh, the Breck, which was great fun, uh, uh -huh. East Anglia and so on. Yeah, but kind of keeping that, keeping that knowledge, as it were, or, or, or making sure that the skills and knowledge is yes. carried on. I yeah. mean, I would say we've now got about 20 nutters, you know, <laughs> and then about another um, 20 followers on. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so do you, do you predict like a, a healthy future for the dandelion? Or well, do you I think, I think, oh, do you mean the dandelion? Well, the dandelion people? 
No, the dandelion plant itself. Oh, good heavens, yes. Yeah. I mean, they're as tough as old boots. Yeah. Um, obviously. Yeah. Having said which, you see, there are dandelions and dandelions. I mean, we all think of um, the things that make the wonderful golden strip down yeah. the front of the road in, yes. in, in, in late April, or we, we think about the horrible weed that we have to keep on yes. trying to get the taproot out of our allotment. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there are lots of exciting dandelions. There are dandelions only found high up on a few Scottish mountain cliffs, right. which have got distributions elsewhere in Svalbard or, 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 or northern Iceland and, right. and so on. Yeah. And, and there are um, Spanish dandelions, which are only found in Cornwall, which I mentioned already. Yeah. Uh, there are stepic dandelions, which are only found in Brett, which I've already mentioned, and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and of course, we have a number of endemics. One of the interesting things, one of the things that kept me busy since I've been retired, is Ireland, because right. Ireland has been very little worked on. And um, a dear friend of mine, Declan Duke, um, about 10 years ago, I suppose, um, uh, said, you know, John, can I get you more involved in, mm. and why don't you come over here? So I went over with him and we had a very good few weeks, just a pair of us. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went back another time to work on with various people on herbarium material mostly. Um, but also they've been sending me loads of stuff. And it turns out that Ireland, not surprisingly, has got its own interesting flora. You know, yeah. there's half a dozen species which are actually quite common there, which are found over us. Uh -huh. And um, so well, that's been good fun. Yeah. I mean, what, a, what an amazing impact you've had across different genes and places and and the sort of I suppose the the culture and education around both yes as well. well that's right yeah. I mean I mean um I mean and we haven't mentioned the floor of Northumberland at all yet. No, I... and, and I'm county recorder or one of the two county recorders for the south of Northumberland as a, a different recorder uh -huh. for the north and in fact the, the, the second recorder of the north is James to whom you're <laughs> talking this <laughs> But also, I have now taken on, or um, I, I'm happy that Nate Rogers has joined me as a, a second recorder in the yeah. South as well. So I think that's that's jolly good. Yeah. Uh, she's an ex colleague of mine, actually. She was in biochemistry. Yeah. Oh, and so, and 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 uh, in your role as the county recorder, how, is it? Are there any major trends you've noticed over a number of years in terms of the the sort of climate change or the nitrogen issue? Or well, yes. I mean, I mean, what 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 it there is a group of um, fairly short-lived seed reproduced, small, montane, as against alpine, yeah. plants of open sites. Right. Um, and there's a whole group of them, about half a dozen, which were moderately common in the county until about 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, had, shall we say, 40, 50 different sites okay. uh, that were known. Um, which have become extinct or almost so. Really? Um, two of them have become completely extinct. A third one, Field Gentian, still has one site in which it managed to summon up 45 plants last year, which right. was actually the best number for some years. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's a very distinct group. Yeah. I mean, they're not related to each other in particular, but they've got a similar uh, ecology and growth habit and so on. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, in, in my view, that, that they are climate uh, victims of climate change but especially of nitrogen right and i think in most of these sites they've, they've just been crowded out they are very much short-lived plants of open sites and so if you go to those sites now they, they are not open anymore you right know? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's the difference yeah uh, they just can't get a foothold yeah against the competitors yeah well well um i think that might be all we have time to cover for today, but I think we must have to do a part two. Well, <laughs> there are quite a lot of things we haven't talked about. I'd like to talk a lot more about Northumberland. I'd like to talk actually about the Natural History Society and, in particular, its botany group and its role in and, and indeed what I've been doing today, which is um, uh, to help cur curate the um, herbarium, uh, the collection of uh, the discovery museum. Yeah. Yes. Uh, of which, uh, of which there are some political issues, which uh, yeah. James will be aware of. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway. Yeah, but well, well, we will have to have a part two yeah. then. But thank you so much indeed for taking what a, what a fascinating and wide ranging and varied life of work you've had. Well, oh, yes, how kind. Yeah. I mean, I said, yes, well, I've enjoyed my work. Yeah. It's been quite a long life now. Yeah. And, and um, um, 
The thing is, you know, I, I really have been an Afro historian for almost 80 years. And I feel, yeah. That gives one quite a lot of space. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like you, it's a life lived outside as well, you know. Yes, I, yes. I suppose that's right. Yeah, yeah. from, from yeah. early days cycling yeah. around yeah. and, yeah. and uh, up Gardening, to... of course. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Well, thank you so yeah. much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Anne.